we've been looking at the book of Ephesians, and we'll eventually finish the book of Ephesians, but uh, tonight I, I really delved into um, what I had planned for tonight on Wednesday night, so let me just read through those verses and make a few comments, and then we're going to begin in verse six, six to 15 for this evening. But first of all, in chapter 5, verse 1 through 7, Paul says to the Ephesians how they're supposed to walk as a Christian. He speaks about our behavior, our conduct, and he speaks about the importance of love, to love each other and to speak well of one another and to encourage each other. And so those verse seven verses that we looked at there, he tells them how the people uh, that... Um, uh, they once were, now that they are changed, creation, and so they are to walk in love. And then verses 8 through 14 for tonight, he speaks about our change. He speaks about our character. He speaks about our command. He speaks about our commission. And he speaks about our calling. He says in verse 8, for you were once darkness, but now are you light in the Lord. Walk as children of light that the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it's shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret, but all things are, that are exposed are made manifest by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore, he says, awake. You who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. And so, all of that, those verses there, uh, speak about walking in the light. So, we're to walk in love, we're to walk in the light, and then for this evening, I want us to look at walking in wisdom. Walking in wisdom. Notice in verse 15, see then that you walk circumspectly. Now that word circumspectly there is an adverb, it tells how, how you are to walk, and that word circumspectly means cautiously, or it means carefully. In other words, see then that you walk circumspectly, cautiously, carefully. Notice he says, not as fools, but as wise. In other words, the, the Ephesians understood the foolishness of that ancient world that they were residing in. They understood what it meant uh, as they have now become a new creation in Christ Jesus. They realize there's been a great transformation in their lives. There's been a great change in their lives. They realize that their characterization or their behavior then must be such that meets uh, the demands of God's word and then they realize the command that they're given to walk cautiously, to walk in love, to walk in light, to walk circumspectly. And then they are given the commission out there to expose the darkness and uh, to shed light upon that. And then we see their call there. He calls, he calls them to awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. And then as he speaks there in verse 15, see then that you walk circumspectly. Uh, see then that you walk carefully. See then that you walk cautiously. Not as fools, he said, but as wise. And then in verse 16, he says, redeeming the time. What he is speaking about there is making every opportunity that you and I have in the world. Now, you know, one of the things I would say that many, many people live their lives not circumspectly, not cautiously and carefully, but many people live their lives and they squander away time. Let me tell you, time, what time you have today, the 24 hours, and we're not even guaranteed that we will live through 24 hours. Uh, anything suddenly can happen in a moment's time. And so Paul wanted these new creations in Christ Jesus, this new transformed life out of the darkness into the light. 
he wanted them to redeem the time. In other words, to seize the day. There's a Latin term called carpe diem, which means seize the day. It means to take every opportunity that you have. To redeem the time, you cannot go back and redeem yesterday, it's gone. You cannot go back and redeem this morning, it's already gone. You cannot go back and redeem this afternoon. All you and I have is this present moment that we live in. And so Paul says to the Ephesians, redeeming the time. In other words, take every opportunity that you have to live like you ought to live so that your testimony would radiate out into a darkened world that we live in. With all of the changes that are going on all over the world tonight, with all of the various things that we are seeing in American life and divisiveness and evil on every hand and the burning of buildings and the burning of cars and all of these kinds of things that where lawlessness is abounding, uh, I, I want you to know the way you and I have to redeem the time is to get up and give the gospel message. We've heard, uh, you know, send the light, send the light, the gospel light, let it shine forevermore. Redeeming the time during these times that I see so many things that um, look like they're the early birth pangs of the very end of the end of times. That's what led me through the Holy Spirit to go back to the book of Revelation to redeem the time, to take the opportunity to make us all aware of where we are and to realize that even though it's been 2,000 years since Jesus went away, to Jesus that would be nothing more than two days. Because the Bible says a thousand years in his sight are as but yesterday. And uh, uh, so, uh, you know, to, to Christ, his uh, economy of time is so differently than ours, but redeeming the time. Someone said to me just today, I cannot believe that I'm seeing all the people die in my generation of, of 60 years of life plus. And uh, I think to redeem the time, notice Paul said not only 2,000 years ago in Ephesus, the Roman Empire was at play there. He says redeeming the time, taking every opportunity to live uh, in the light, to walk in love, and to cautiously live life. He said, because the days are evil. And you and I have seen evil days. Uh, down through human history, there have always been evil days. But I don't think that there has been the intensity and the growing of wickedness and evil and lawlessness that is abounding today. Someone in our congregation today walked up to me and said, uh, one of my family members is in law enforcement was very scared about those that were coming to the Oklahoma City area this weekend. And so we are living in a time uh, that uh, to say that good is evil and evil is good, as the Bible speaks about, it's a very, very strange time in all of our lifetime. So Paul encourages walking in wisdom, redeem the time, take every opportunity. Uh, to witness for Christ, to give evidence of your testimony through a word, through, through encouragement, uh, by loving each other. Uh, I still can't help but go back and think about Joe Brennis. I've thought about him all day. Uh, Joe and Eula Karen were great friends of mine. And uh, uh, they were here every Wednesday night and Sunday night, if her health permitted, and she died on March the 11th, uh, even though she had a, uh, an illness that had been with her for quite some time, but she died quickly and, and suddenly. And Joe found out two weeks ago he had lung cancer. He died just after midnight. When I was talking with one of his sons today, uh, he said, Dad doesn't want a service. He doesn't want a visitation at the funeral home. He just wants everybody to be safe from this virus. Now, I don't know how much more you can love people than to try to protect other people. And I, I thought to myself, you know, I hate these masks. I know that they're hot. I know it's hard to breathe in them. But I would sure hate to think 
that if I were an asymptomatic person and I accidentally gave that to someone else and, and they died, how would I feel? And so, you know, I, I just want to try to do what I think Jesus would have us do, think about other people uh, over ourselves. And I, I bring that up only because I think of Joe's life and I think about that even in death, he was thinking of other people. When I was able to go see him on Friday evening and he said, please pray for me. He said he was wanting me to pray for him a prayer today when I prayed for him on Friday. But just after midnight, he slipped out of this world into the presence of the Lord, seizing every opportunity, redeeming the time, doing what you and I can to reach out to others and to help others and to be an encouragement to others. He says, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools but wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise. He says, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Let me tell you, if you want to know what the will of the Lord is, get into the Word of God. The will of the Lord is for you and I to know Christ in a personal, intimate way, to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and then to live our lives, to, to love the Lord with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength, and then secondly, to love our neighbor as we love ourselves, and then to share uh, the good news of the mystery of this gospel of, of his church and salvation to a world out there that so desperately needs that. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. To know that one of these days you and I stand in the presence of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, we will stand individually to give an accounting of our lives, of what we've done. Have we seized the opportunities? Have we lived our lives? Have we walked in love? Have we walked in light? Have we walked with wisdom, not the wisdom of this world, but godly wisdom that can only come from asking the Lord for wisdom, and we can seek that through his word and understand what spiritual wisdom is versus the wisdom of this present world. Verse 18, he moves on and says, Do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, that day, just as it is in our day, uh, liquor was uh, certainly at an all-time high in the world out there. Paul understood that if these uh, Christians were going to have an influence in their world, that what they needed to be filled with was the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of the living God. He said, be filled with the Spirit. We mentioned that this morning in Sunday school. You and I have to do that every day of our lives we can't read enough of the Bible today to last us through tomorrow and the next day or until next Sunday. So redeeming the opportunity to be filled with the Holy Spirit of the living God. Then he moves to verse 19 and he says, Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord just as Keith and Curtis did tonight, and just as Mona and Jana did this morning. Uh, you know, uh, I don't know about you, but hymns and spiritual songs, uh, those things, the Psalms, they uplift us, don't they? And uh, they give us hope in our moments of despair. And so he's teaching them here about wisdom, living life to the fullest, to the max, as Christ would have us to live. <clears throat> then he says in verse 20, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father. Notice, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know when you pray, how you pray, but I know this. I always love to invoke that in the name of Jesus we pray. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice that. He says, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me tell you, <clears throat> if we're going to get 
uh, to Jesus or to God, how do we get to him? Through his son. <clears throat> Pardon me, through his son, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and so he speaks about our thankfulness. And then in verse 21, he's sub submitting. That word submit means to yield, to submit, <clears throat> to yield to one another. Notice in the fear of God, that word fear there means reverence, awe, respect. Now you and I are living in a time where there's not a lot of respect for God. Would you agree to that? Uh, I'll let me tell you, in our world today, there are all kinds of uh, uh, languages that are being uh, spoken out there. People invoke the name of God in the most uh, blasphemous ways. Thank you, Brent. And uh, so submitting to one another in the fear of God, he's speaking about yielding uh, to one another. Notice that fear means the awesome presence of an almighty God. It means to have reverence for him. And then he moves to verse 22. And now he's going to talk about the family. How to have a spirit-filled marriage. Wives, yield or submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he's the savior of the body. Now God created Adam, and then God took one of Adam's ribs, and he created Eve. The husband is not to uh, uh, lord it over the wife, but he is to lead the family. He's to be the leader in the family. And uh, just as Christ is the head of this church, I may be pastor, but he's the head. Uh, he, is, he is the top one that we go to, that we seek out. And so now he says, if you want to have a spirit-filled home and a spirit-filled uh, marriage, then this is the way to do it. Therefore, he said, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. But then he moves to the husbands in verse 25. And he says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her that he might sanctify, that means set apart, and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. The church, uh, when we read the scriptures, it's the washing of of the word. And so what he is saying is that the husband has his place and the wife has her place and they are co-equals even though the husband should be the head of the family just as Christ is the head of his church. And then in verse 27 he says there that he might present her to himself a glorious church. You and I are the church. We're living in the church age. It's also referred to as the age of grace. Since the day of Pentecost, when 3,000 souls were born that day into the kingdom of God and the Holy Spirit descended and came and indwelt the believer. We're living in the church age. And Paul says that he might present her to himself a glorious church, speaking of Christ being the head of the church. Notice not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she, speaking about the church, should be holy and without blemish. Now, that's something that is hard for we as Christians to get a real grip on, but that's the way we are to live our lives. We are to live our lives. Christ is the head of the church. If we love Christ, then we love his church. If we love his church, then we are to walk circumspectly, cautious, carefully in order to keep the unity of the spirit of the church. How do we do that? Let me tell you, the church through the washing of the word, then the church can be what Christ would have the church to be. Then he comes to verse 28. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. I don't know if any of you ever watched Dateline NBC, 48 Hours, 2020, any of those. 
But oftentimes, and last night on whichever one it was it was on, two of those were on on Friday night, one's on on Saturday night. But it, it was showing the abusiveness of boyfriends and husbands. And uh, let me tell you, we live in a very, very, very abusive world. Let me tell you, the devil doesn't want the devil doesn't want the home to be what Christ wants it to be. And so Satan is doing everything that he can to disrupt the home. And where there are now many, many parents that are uh, just a one-parent family to kids. And uh, how very sad that is. If people live their lives by the commands, the principles, the precepts of the Word of God, things would not be the way they are. He says in verse 29, For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. In other words, we are to love our flesh, not our flesh, but we are to love our bodies because God created us in his likeness, in his image. And we are to love our mate that way. As Christ loves the church. And then he moves on and he says, For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Now, many of you grew up in a different era of time than kids are today. Uh, right now, probably there are more kids and grandkids that are living with parents than, than ever before. Uh, when many of you during your day, Hester, I can't even imagine 92 years ago. I can't even imagine all the changes you've seen in the world. And uh, in world history, American history, changes in the family from what they used to be. Uh, you will remember the family years ago used to take care of their loved ones when they got sick, and they took care of them at home. Any of y'all remember that? Uh, whenever you got married, your mom and dad probably told you, now it's time for you to leave the flock, leave the nest, and go out and make it on your own. But kids today cannot even make it on their own. And so we're living in a very, very stressful, distressed period of time in people's lives and times are tough and life is difficult and life is hard. But notice what Paul said to the Ephesians, for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, Paul says. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. Uh, it's a great mystery that we are the bride of Christ. One day we will be presented to him uh, without spot and without wrinkle when we have made that period of time called our glorification. And so he says in verse 33, Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. So in chapter 5, some of the great truths that we carry away, he speaks about the importance of love. He speaks about a love that is an unconditional love. It's an agape love. That word means a godly love that knows no condition. As God loved us so much that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Unfortunately, two-thirds of this world <clears throat> do not believe in him. And so you can see where we are in the world, why the world's in such a mess, and why the world's in the shape that it's in. So he speaks about the importance of love. When Paul wrote to the <clears throat> church at Corinth, 1 Corinthians, he said, now abides faith, hope, and love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. And then he tells us in verses 8 through 14, to walk in light. We were once lost, but as the song says, but now we're found. And so he says, now that we're found, we need to walk 
behave, conduct our lives in the light of who Christ is because we are light in the world. The light of the world is Jesus. When I mentioned this morning about one of these days when the church has gone out of here, and can you only imagine what this world is going to be when millions and millions and millions all over the world will suddenly be snatched away. The world will not see that. They will know immediately that something very catastrophic has happened. I read some time ago, it's maybe been a year or so ago when I was reading about the rapture of the church and studying about the rapture of the church, that uh, they're already preparing to try to come up with some scientific reason one of these days when millions and millions of people will be gone. Uh, they're looking at some kind of scientific gravitational force. Well, let me tell you, I just happen to know who that is. I happen to know the author of the gravitational force, don't you? And so uh, the world will know something very drastic has happened, but they will not see the rapture of the church. It will happen so suddenly and so quickly that we will be out of here. And you can only imagine the upheaval of the world. And you talk about darkness there. Paul said, for you were once darkness. Let me tell you, it's going to be a darkened world for sure during the days of the tribulation. But he speaks about love. He speaks about light. And then those verses we just read, he speaks about wisdom. Use the brain that God gave you. Let me tell you, we all have a brain and God expects us to use it. Seize the opportunity to walk in spiritual wisdom uh, in this world. And then verses 22 to 33, he speaks about having the spirit-filled marriage. And if people would take verses 22 to 33 of Ephesians chapter 5, marriages, families, homes would be so much more than what they are today. Unfortunately, the devil's alive, his emissaries are alive, his uh, demons are out there doing everything they can, and we are in a spiritual conflict as long as you and I are in this present world. And that's why this morning we looked in Ephesians chapter 6 in our Sunday school lesson to see how we are to be dressed as Christians in order to counteract and to combat the forces of evil that come against us. Wednesday night we'll pick up in chapter 6 and we'll look about how to have a spirit-filled home with children and parents, bond servants, and masters, and then uh, how to deal with uh, spiritual warfare, some of what we learned this morning in our Sunday school class. God bless you. Thank you for being here tonight. Would you stand as Keith comes to uh, sing a verse of invitation with our heads bowed, our eyes closed. If anyone uh, needs tonight to come and join the church or to give their heart and life to Jesus, would you just do that? Maybe you're listening by live stream tonight out there and you've never had a personal relationship with Christ. Maybe you will tune in to this broadcast somewhere at some point. I want to encourage you that the most important decision in all of life is first and foremost to know Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. How can I do that? By admitting that I'm a sinner and that I need a Savior. And to pray and ask Christ, forgive me of my sins. You shed your blood to cover my sins. You rose from the dead. You are my living hope. Would you come into my heart and life and be the Lord of my life? Uh, because I want to be in heaven with you one of these days. And I want to live in that eternal state of heaven that will be upon this earth at some point in eternity future. Father God, thank you for tonight. If someone needs to make a decision, may they come in these quiet moments. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.